Hello everybody, welcome back to Big On the Inside, the new Who Doctor Who Watch Long Podcast. This week we're back with another interview special and we're talking to Paul Hayes. Paul Hayes is a writer and radio producer and author of The Long Game, the inside story on how the BBC brought back Doctor Who. It's available to buy online. I'm going to link everything in the description below. You've got to go check it out. I've given the book a read. It's fantastic. Here's an interview that Paul kindly gave to me about what it was like writing the book and some really fun details about how the BBC, Russell T. Davis, brought back Doctor Who. Okay, Paul. So my first question is why the book? Why do you think now is the best time for this book to come out on basically a quick sell why should Dot Who fans go out and buy the book? Well, uh, hopefully Dot Who fans will buy the book if they are the type of fan who's interested in, as I think many of us are, that behind the scenes, as I think I say in the introduction of the book, lifting the bonnet and seeing how it all works. I think there's a certain type of Doctor Who fan, not universally, but there's a certain subset of fans who who love seeing how it all works, how it all comes together. And being a Doctor Who fan, uh, quite often, doesn't it, leads into an interest in wider television history, broadcasting history, the history of the BBC. So if you are that type of fan who's very interested in perhaps the broader context and background as to why certain points in Doctor Who's history have happened in the way they did, hopefully this book will satisfy that sort of curiosity for this particular period, which is from the aftermath of the TV movie in May 1996 to the recommissioning of the series in September 2003. If you're interested in that process, how we got from the first point to the second, and how the BBC changed over that time, and why it changed over that time, hopefully this is the sort of book you'll be interested in. And as for the why... Um, there was no special uh, thing with the timing, really. It ended up, coincidentally, tying in with the fact that Russell T. Davis was announced yet again on the last Friday in September as the showrunner of Doctor Who, but that was purely coincidental. It was something I'd been working on for a while. I'd had a go at writing it a few years ago. I got a draft written, but it was all done from secondary sources. I wasn't able to get anyone to speak to me for interviews at that time. Uh, well, I got one person to speak to me at that time, but but uh, most of the other people I just couldn't get responses from for one reason or another. But uh, last year, I, I kept... It's sort of thing where every new year I would say to myself, oh, I must go back to that. I must go back and have another go at that because I'd first had a go at it in sort of 2015 into 2016. And finally last year, I got around to doing it and trying people again. And this time I was able to secure almost all of the interviews that I wanted and people were very generous with their time and uh, so it, it worked out very well and uh, yeah so so the, the timing is sort of coincidental that it's happened now uh, when Davis has been announced again but uh, yeah hopefully if you're interested in that 96 to 83 period this is this is the book for you sorry that's quite a long and rambling answer to your first question there no it was when you were speaking there I suddenly realized as I'm 23 at the moment so that era of Doctor Who especially what's classed as new Who is sort of my era and I don't think it's the, the production side of it, especially how it came back, isn't that well documented. You don't hear that much stuff about it. It's almost the key moments in that regard are when the show was made and when it was cancelled. Those are sort of the parts we really sort of know the most about. So it's quite interesting to sort of really deep dive into what actually caused it to come back. Yeah, I think that there, there, there is a lot of stuff out there, but it's all in different parts. Mm. Uh, I always felt that um, the genesis of the show in 1962 into 63 was something that's been very well... It's a fascinating period. It's very well documented. But I, I didn't think there was something that quite did quite the same job for the lead up to the recommission in 2003 i mean there's lots of different individual elements out there there's um, uh, a documentary with russell t davis and jane tranter called um uh, uh doctor forever the unquiet dead which is on the green death special edition dvd Kevin scott did a, a very good series of articles for doctor who magazine in 2013 on the 10th anniversary of the recommission but again only, only the first part of that series of articles was really about the lead up to the recommission the rest of it was was more about the, the making of the first series uh yeah. but and there's all sorts of individual interviews and documentaries and articles that told different bits of the story and, and i uh, perhaps like you didn't feel there was something that drew it all together and provided that wider background and context which is what i've hopefully tried to do with this book no definitely um i mentioned to you earlier that i um i really i, I read some of the book and i really enjoyed the parts i was reading because as a Doctor Who fan, you sort of assume that you sort of know it all, especially when you when you co-host a podcast. You sort of think, "Oh yeah, I know how this show works," and then I get four pages into your book, and I'm like, "I've never heard of any of these names, but they're obviously very, very important <laughs> into why the show came back." And I'm like, oh, "What? There's like unsung heroes, really." 
Well, it's good. I mean, it's it's, it's always I, I I basically tried to write the the sort of book I'd want to read. I, I basically I wrote the book in many ways because I wanted to read it. This was a book I wanted to read, and mm. I didn't feel it existed. Uh, as I say, with all those elements in one place. So in the end, I just had to, the only way I could read it was by writing it. So yeah. it's always nice. I mean, I I'm, I remember, it's, it's lovely to hear you say that because I remember, you know, reading the, the Doctor Who books that have fascinated me down the years, all the, uh, you know, the various behind the scenes ones, all kinds of different bit, bits and pieces about different elements of the story. And and yeah, it's, 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 it's always wonderful to... to it's always surprising how much new information there is out there about all kinds of different elements of the show. I mean, there's nobody, let's face it, there's a lot of people who think they know everything about Doctor Who, but in yeah. reality, nobody <laughs> knows everything about Doctor Who. Not a single True. person in the world knows everything about what's ever happened in the whole of Doctor Who. I mean, I think that is one of the enticing things about it, isn't it? I mean, uh, one of the th- ways Doctor Who really captivated me as a child was because I, there was so much of it, and it was I'd seen so little of it, and it seemed like such a big mysterious mythological mm. thing and i'd get little glimpses of its history here and there when i got to see stories i hadn't seen before uh but i think the same is true for the behind the scenes as well it, 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 it's it, as well, much as the in universe fiction of the show is this big mythological thing which you can become fascinated by i think the same is true for the behind the scenes it has all these different elements to its history it has this you know so many elements of it you can study it's been going for so long and there's so many different parts that can intrigue you so i I think the behind the scenes can be as fascinating as 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 the fiction on screen yeah i definitely agree and i think we've noticed when we've done the podcast if we do an episode titled um, for instance, David Tennant returning, it won't get nearly as many views as Russell T. Davis returning or Stephen Moffat. Ret- these the behind the scenes names really now seem to be the stars of the show almost. Maybe and so uh, to, to a certain group of fans. I mean, there the, the used to be uh, perhaps not so much now. Uh, now fandoms are much sort of broader and more diverse and interesting place. But there used to be this sort of stereotype, which I'm always aware <laughs> I maybe sometimes sound as if I fall into. That there's a certain sort of archetype of Doctor Who fan who finds kind of you know plot and characterization is irrelevant. You know, yeah. <laughs> what we, we're more, much more interested in you know the production dates of the story when it went into the studio, when the pre-filming was done, and uh, and uh, you know not actually. I like to think I'm not like that. I'm. I like to feel I'm just as interested in. I could be just as interested in going on. You know, the ridiculous Doctor Who wikia. You know, the Tardis wikia, and looking up yeah. all these arcane <laughs> details of, of in the universe fiction as I can be looking up the behind the scenes stuff. But it is true that I mean, I'm not a member. I'm not really as into any other show as I am Doctor Who. So I don't know if this is true. But it is sometimes said that Doctor Who fandom does get much more deeply under the skin and much more interested in the making of the show than perhaps certain other fandoms do. I don't know whether necessarily um, Star Trek or Buffy or Game of Thrones or what have you, I don't know if they necessarily have that same... You know, you could fill libraries with the books that have been written about Doctor Who's history and it's on the the behind-the-scenes terms and all the different aspects. And I don't necessarily know if that's the case for other shows. No, I think I would agree with you there. Um, You mentioned earlier about eventually getting all these cool interviews for the book how did you find researching how did you find the research because i imagine it's it's more than just like you say reading tardis wiki there must be a lot of learning stuff from various interviews that you conducted yourself yes it's i mean a lot of it was almost kind of embedded in me because this was a period that i really grew up through really i was 12 years old when the tv movie went out and when the recommission happened in 2003, I was 19. I was in my second year at university. So, you know, the, the, the amount you change from sort of being in year seven to being in the second year at uni, that yeah. felt like a massively long time period to me just because you change so much between mm. ages 12 and 19. But at the same time, I really felt, not consciously, but subconsciously, but looking back on it, I feel as if I, I really absorbed a lot of information about what was going on in the world of Doctor Who around that time. So a lot of the news stories I talk about in the book, uh, a lot of the, the rumours that were going around, all that kind of thing, I I, I, yeah. I I grew up through them in a way. And so a lot of it was kind of embedded in me. So a lot of that element of it, obviously I didn't just trust my memories. I went back and researched things properly. But a, but a lot of the chronology of it was kind of embedded in my consciousness <laughs> from growing up through it at the time. But um, yeah, no, in, in, in terms of... Um, uh, research. Yeah, I did a lot of research through obviously DWM pieces. A lot of um, uh, I was very lucky to have access to a system that meant I could look up 
uh, newspaper articles going back decades. So I was able to put in certain key search terms to uh, to, to find uh, different articles that helped me with uh, looking up, particularly the BBC history and the wider context of what was going on in the BBC at the time. And um, in terms of getting the interviews with people, I was very lucky that I was very fortunate in that um, I, I never thought of it as being uh, my lockdown project as such. But it is true that I ended up doing a lot of the interviews um, while the first lockdown was going on last year and I think I was lucky in that respect that obviously a lot of these people still work in the TV industry and uh, there wasn't yeah. a lot of TV being made at the time so they were perhaps had more time on their hands and were more amenable to being approached to be interviewed but uh, uh, so I just approached people uh, a lot of them I, I, I found out where they now worked so I was able to interview them through their companies or I was able to approach them on social media and uh, or I knew people who knew them and I was able to sort of uh, get people to put me in touch so yeah I was very lucky really as I say I managed to get uh, interviews with, with, with almost everyone that I was hoping to speak to so I was I was very fortunate yeah you took you touched on it there um sort of talk about like the internet forums and stuff and in chapter 12 as you told me a minute ago I won't pretend I was I could remember that off the top of my head in chapter 12 um you talk about all the rights of the of the series mm. and all the internet speculation about what was left over from the tv movie and what was gonna hopefully mm. become the 2005 series and one thing that really surprised me from that is that i basically sort of assumed that the sort of online fandom of doctor who was really sort of a new thing that sort of started when tenant sort of took over but um i was completely wrong no yeah long before i mean i remember being on the outpost gallifrey forum the day the recommission was announced in september um 2003 we we include a little bit of that thread in the um in the last chapter which is about the announcement and because yeah. luckily i saved it i saved that thread because sean who <laughs> ran out Gallifrey, he does I, I speak to sean for the book sean lyon who ran out Gallifrey. that was kind of out Gallifrey was the main this is pre-social media so in those days before social media um forums were really the main avenue for discussion for fans and before that um usenet news groups rec arts doctor who is one that gets mentioned frequently in the book um uh i mean forums are quite popular again because reddit is just basically a bunch of forums isn't it so it's sort of come around yeah. again because for, for but anyway that's that that's by the by so um but obviously so forums they were obviously more like reddit than they were social media uh, they worked a bit more like that but yeah uh, outpost gallifrey was was very big for, for, for uh, i think sean opened the forums there in 2001 um, and before that, it had been the Rec Arts Doctor Who. So there'd been, I wasn't a part of online fandom until, yeah, the early 2000s. I think we got the internet home when I was 16, which was mm. 2000. But I'd say a lot of fans had been online from probably the mid 90s. And, and, and the, Rec Arts, the Rec Arts Doctor Who um, news group is a fascinating thing to look back on. You can still search the archives. I mean, the Google. Yeah, I own all the Usenet archives now, and you can if you you can look them up on there, which is how I looked up some of the threads. Unfortunately, the search function doesn't work very well, so you really have to persevere if you're trying to search through it. But uh, it is faster because you can find. I mean, uh, the famous example is uh, obviously Stephen Moffat in the '90s was a regular poster on Rec Arts Doctor Who, and uh, I can't remember when it was. It was about '95, '96. Stephen Moffat, as a fan, posted this thread on Rec Arts Doctor Who saying something like i'm paraphrasing now but it says something like i've come up with this very silly idea that i'm very proud of um uh what if uh the word doctor uh, meaning healer and wise man is actually something we get from the doctor and it's implanted in us from all his visits and he later on puts <laughs> this usenet post of his almost word for word into a good man goes to war which, yeah. which i think is quite funny uh so yeah they're, they're, they're interesting archives to look back on definitely sadly you can't look at the outpost gallifrey archives because sean when he shut outpost gallifrey down in 2009 he um he decided it was best to take it i mean he explains in the book that um he just felt it was best for you know people to start with a clean slate and it wasn't fair on people to um you know have their have what they said perhaps you know online forevermore so he, he took the outpost kit, which I, I personally feel was a shame but I mean it was Sean's forum it's up to him but anyway sorry I've given another very very long rambling answer but yes basically <laughs> online fandom online fandom uh, did exist it, sort of it, it, certainly um, you know it was really getting going from the mid 90s onwards and certainly by the turn of the century by the millennium there was uh, mm. yeah it was it was very much alive and kicking online fandom yeah there's one very amusing um um, anecdote in your book from a from a guy who refers to himself as Bob, who oh, um, yes. yeah. declares that Doctor Who will never return. Um, 
because the, the Americans won't allow it. And I did, I took the quote from the book and I put it into my Google search bar and it did come up. It was, it was one of one results. So uh, for anybody who does pick up the book, you can go back and find some of these stuff. Like yeah, you're saying. that was it's that was really a rumor great. that was around. Yeah, it was a rumor that was around at the time. And as you as you you'll have read in the book, not just in fandom, there were BBC executives who thought this was the case that the rights had been somehow. They didn't maybe necessarily know what it was, but they felt that it was complicated and the rights were maybe in America or something. And yeah, that yeah. post from this person referring to as Bob. Um, he uh, he says that uh, the BBC basically he, the claim was this was a big rumor that went around fandom at the time that when the TV movie was made the BBC had somehow accidentally sold the rights to Doctor Who forever to Universal, yeah. um, which I mean I never personally believed that time I felt that was just but but I think people well there's a certain subset of people who like believing conspiracy theories isn't there especially in, in yeah. fandoms people love believing conspiracy theories and people Definitely. people i think like the idea that the bbc may have been stupid enough to have sold off the family <laughs> silver like that they they, they kind yeah. of liked believe they thought oh yeah typical bbc would do that wouldn't they <laughs> but uh, that was never the case but it was certainly yeah that was certainly a rumor that definitely went around at that time in the early 2000s yeah why do you think the rights ended up in such a, a mess then what do you think led to that? Do you think it was just people not caring about the show as much anymore, or people? What well, because it is a really your book, and I'm like, how did this get so? Like, how did yeah, they mess I this mean, up so bad? It wasn't so. I think it wasn't so much that the rights were a mess. It was that they were people thought they were a mess. If you see what I mean, the people yes. in power that they. They, I mean, they hold the whole issue that BBC Worldwide, the what, what was then the commercial arm of the BBC, the part of the BBC that um, made tie-in merchandise, did home media releases, all that kind of thing. The, the, the arm of the BBC that made money on top of what they got in from the licence fee. Yeah. They were trying to make a film. And somehow, it's not quite clear why they seemed to have... They were the part of the BBC that seemed to have kind of, quote-unquote, ownership over Doctor Who. They, they seemed to have basically picked up the ball and walked off with it and decided they were in charge of what happened with it. I mean, as you'll have read in the chapter, Rupert Gavin and Mike Phillips and Worldwide, they kind of claim it wasn't quite like that. But everyone on the television side, Doreen Hegesy and Jane Tranter and Alan Yentob, they very much give the impression it was like that. So you had the issue that Worldwide, they seemed to be in charge and they wanted to make a film and they didn't want a television series to be made while they were trying to get a film made. And there was this general perception, obviously, that some people thought there was this perception that, oh, are the rights tied up in America because of what happened with the TV movie? That wasn't true, but that was what some people thought. And there was a kind of, there was this awareness that a couple of the interviewees in the book refer to, I think Jane Tranter and Rupert Gavin both refer to it. There was this awareness that the BBC, although they owned the format of Doctor Who, they didn't own all the elements of the pro they didn't own the, the prime one is the Daleks, for example, that they, yeah. they co-owned the rights to the Daleks with Terry Nation. And there was this awareness that, it was complicated to use the Daleks because of the rights that the nation estate held. So I think uh, there was a, there was, even though the BBC always, as far as I've been able to tell, and I'm pretty sure this is the case, BBC has always owned the underlying intellectual property rights to Doctor Who. Uh, that's never been in dispute, but there was a, there was maybe not an understanding of that. And there was a perception that things were much more complicated than they actually were. And as I think Clayton Hickman says in the book, maybe just, just not the desire until the whole project with Russell came about, maybe just nobody had the desire to just sit down and work it out and, and find out what the situation was. Yeah, it's, it's a good job Russell came along then. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't, one of the parts of the book that I really did like is, um, I sort of touched on it earlier, like how it's sort of the fans who are really sort of responsible for the fact that the show came back. And not just fans online and on forums or sending off letters, but fans who worked at the BBC. Um, that's just like a really cool little insight into this sort of extra fandom, really, almost. Like, there's like, I always, I sort of read it and I looked at it as like there was like little spy moles working within the BBC, purposely there just to try and bring the show back almost. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, I think, again, going back to that thing about how Doctor Who fans um, seem to be more prone than perhaps certain other fandoms to become interested in the behind the scenes, that yeah. then leads on to a lot of Doctor Who fans then become interested in uh, making careers for themselves in the industry. There's a quote from Russell T. Davis, which I didn't end up using in the book because I didn't need to, but the, the, it's, there's a quote from him in the final chapter from a piece he wrote. Uh, it was a piece about Fury from the Deep. 
Uh, and it was for Doctor, uh, Doctor Who magazine, their, their second Doctor special in 2003, a few months before the new series was announced. And he talks in this piece, and I quote a bit from it in the last chapter, about how there's something about Doctor Who fans that 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 um, we uh, we become uh, you know interested in the production side, and it leads on to careers in television. And he, in that piece, he makes this comparison. He says, um, uh, "When I meet other Doctor Who fans in the industry, they're fellow writers or directors or producers." And then he says, <laughs> rather cruelly, but Russell being Russell, I'm sure he doesn't mean this cruelly. He says, um, "When I meet Star Trek fans in the industry, they're making me coffee." You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is uh, there is that element that a lot of an, an interest in Doctor Who, not not universally, but but within a certain subset of fans, an interest yeah. in Doctor Who leads on to an interest in that behind the scenes thing, which then leads on to us becoming, you know, writers, producers, directors ourselves. I mean, I I work in my day job as a radio producer, and I'm I'm absolutely entirely sure I would not be doing the job I am if I hadn't had that interest in broadcast interest in broadcasting that was sparked by my, my love of Doctor Who and my interest in, in how Doctor Who was made. So I think there is 100%. a lot of Doctor Who fans do go into the industry. And of course, naturally, as time went on, that put several of them in positions where they were able to um, to help bring the show back. Yeah, I mean, uh, my co-host Harry, who isn't here, um, he, he just graduated from university with an MA in acting. And he cites what Doctor Who, especially Tennant being one of the main reasons he sort of realised what an actor was and that he wanted to be an actor. And I'm currently studying film at university and just about to enter my final year. And if it wasn't for programmes like Doctor Who Confidential, you mm. you wouldn't have that, that, like you said, that spark that's lit that basically sets off a, a, a whole new interest of hobbies and passion, really. Well, it was the same thing, I mean, uh, with David Tennant himself, wasn't it? I think he's spoken several times down the years about how his interest in acting was sparked by by Doctor Who. So it goes back that, uh, yeah, there, there is something about Doctor Who that does... Uh, we want to become, even if not necessarily part of it, part of that, that world. You know, we become interested yeah. in being filmmakers or broadcasters or producers or writers. You know, it inspires a lot of creativity, Doctor Who, and that, that's one of the nice things about it, I think. Yeah, so I've got one last question for you, and it's why do you think, after all this time, that the show has lasted? What do you think it is that keeps the fans coming back? Because there's <laughs> fans out there who go, I don't like this era as much as the last era, but they still stick with it. Even if, you know, you read online, they can't stand certain eras. They will <laughs> stick with it because they want to love the show, and perhaps they do and perhaps they don't. But what is it, do you think, about the show that just keeps people so infused because i've had passions for stuff like star wars and dc comics but they sort of come and go but doctor who has always sort of seemed to be there for so many people yeah well i mean if i knew the answer to that i'd bottle it and sell it off for millions wouldn't I? <laughs> but uh there's a couple of there's a couple of thoughts i have on that one of them is the fact that um, for many of us, you know, we're kind of born into it, aren't we? I mean, it's for most Doctor Who fans, particularly in the UK, I don't know if this is necessarily the case overseas, but particularly in the UK, we normally come across it when we're very young. Mm. And uh, it really gets, and in that respect, it's very like a kind of um, a sports fan, like being a fan of a football team. You're almost, you're not aware of when you first become, fall in love with it. It's, it's almost part of your life that you grow up with. Um, I live in Norwich, and uh, last weekend Norwich lost uh, 7 0 in the Premier League. Yes. But those fans, I mean, the fans, they're still going to go on Sunday to go and see Norwich play Leeds. Canna Road be full of yeah. 25,000 people. Not, f- football fans all over the country, you know, they will stand and watch their team be absolutely battered and be terrible and awful. And they'll, they'll, they'll turn to their fan next to them and say, Well, I'm not coming next week. I'm not coming next week. This is awful. This is the worst they've ever been. And they'll still be there next week. You can't yeah. not go. You can't sit at home and not go if you know the matches on and it's very like you know i can't imagine it obviously there have been the odd episode of Doctor Two down the years when i've had to go to you know someone's wedding or something where i've not been able to see the episode yeah. you know <laughs> broadly speaking i can't imagine and i'm not I'm, i don't mean this to criticize people who do i'm just saying this is for me personally i can't imagine ever being in a position where doctor who was on and i was at home and i wouldn't be watching it even if i yeah. even if the whole rest of that series had been terrible and i hadn't enjoyed any of it I can't just put myself in that mental space where I wouldn't put the TV on and watch it, you know? It's yeah. something a lot of us have bought. So I think that kind of being born into element of it is very strong for a lot of us. And the other thing about it is, is that because of this weird old format of Doc 2 that's kind of organically grown over the years and been contributed by so many of these people, 
Doctor Who, unlike a lot of other things, it can never really jump the shark and it can never really be finished. Yeah. I mean, you and I, we will grow old, we will die. I'm sorry to break it to you. We will never see the end of Doctor Who. We will no. never see. We I will never, never thought see, of that. <laughs> we will never see the last episode of Doctor Who. We will never see how Doctor Who ultimately pans out because even if it goes off air again for a while, it will still come back. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Davis has said this down the years a lot, hasn't he? That the, the fact that the revival was so successful has guaranteed the fact that it will continue to be revived in the future. Yeah, and uh, because of the the way it works, the way it's structured. Um, uh, you can never put a full stop on it and say it's finished. You know, I suppose in the old days, perhaps said, "Oh well, you know, the Thirteenth Doctor," but you know, that's all gone now. You know, so uh, you, you can't ever, and there, there'll always be that, even if you're not enjoying a particular period of it because you know you don't like the particular um, showrunner or the Doctor or what have you. You always know that there's going to be another one along in a few years, and and even when we had that twenty six years and it was all done. It never felt like... I mean, fandom during that time, it, very few fans were content to say, well, you know, we've had 26 years, that's all fine. You know, People always wanted it to come back because yeah. th- there's always that sense of the potential of Doctor Who, isn't there? You, you, you know, because of that format as well, there's always... It's always got the potential to be brilliant. So you always want to yeah. see what's going to happen with it next. And uh, so there, that's my two... Ex- I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but other than that, old, there's a cliche... I don't know if people still use this cliche, but there used to be that cliche that it it had, a, you know, indefinable magic, which was a kind of get out for saying, I've got no idea why Doctor Who is this popular whatsoever. But those are my two closest explanations I can give you, that, that, it's, that it's like a fandom you're born into, like with a football team, and because it can never be finished. So we always we always know that there can always it's got that potential to have more. And I think those are the two reasons why it's got that that itch keeps going inside us that we can never quite finish scratching. And there you have it. That was a really nice chat I was able to have with Paul. Thank you so much to Paul for coming on the show. Absolutely amazing to have um a really exciting author guest. I think it's the first time we've actually had an author. We've had writers come on the show who wrote for Doctor Who, wrote for Big Finish, um, but to actually have an author of a published book you can go and buy is very exciting. Go and collect the book. Go and buy it. The links are in the description. Go and get it. It's great. There is so much stuff in there you don't know about Doctor Who. Thank you for helping us get past 600 subscribers. Absolutely fantastic. If you're listening to this on Spotify, give us a follow. iTunes, leave us a five-star review. YouTube, leave us a comment, a thumbs up, and subscribe. We love it. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. And hopefully, we can get some very, very exciting guests in the near future.